Why hexagonal cells? Let's start by defining what a cell is. A cell is an area over which a base station has a good coverage. So this is the base station, and we have an area that is having a good coverage. This is called a cell. What is the shape of this of this cell? An actual cell footprint would be, of course, irregular. The reason for that is because we have shadowing, we have, and as we have seen before, we have other uh, multipath issues, and as an actual footprint would be irregular. Now, a regular cell shape is needed for mathematical convenience for systematic design, because we want to have a generic understanding. An intuitive shape would be the circular shape, to use circles. And this is intuitive because the power will get separated, will get dissipated as we go away from the isotropic radiator in a, in a kind of a sphere. So in 2D, that is a circle. The problem with circles, circles do not lend themselves easily to coverage analysis. So if you have an area, for example, a square area, we have two options. Either we have overlapping circles or we have to leave uncovered spaces like we have here. And this is why we don't use cells in our analysis. We don't use circles. The only shape that can be stacked perfectly are we have three options. We have square, triangles, and hexagon. The beauty about the hexagon is that it lends itself, it's the closest shape to the circle. So if you have this circle, then the hexagon will fit very well. And we have the limited number of, uh, this is the closest shape uh, to the circle. If you use square or triangle, you will miss most of the coverage of the covered area. So this is to answer why hexagonal cells. We'll learn a few things about, about the hexagonal cells as we go on. Antenna positioning considerations. Let's say that we agree that we're going to have hexagonal cells to cover the area. There are two options to locate the antenna or to position the antenna, either um, center excited where the antenna is in the middle. And usually we have three sectors. So if you have 120, 120, 120, but three antennas are placed in the center. We could also, we also could have edge excited cells where we can think of the antenna as being in the edge. The reason for using this type of coverage could be having some obstructions in the middle. So we have two options, either centered excited where an antenna is placed at the center of the cell, or uh, we have three of the vertices will we'll have antennas like here, one, two, three, and the other three will have no antennas. And this is called edge excited cells. Practical consideration may not allow the base station to be placed exactly where you want, here in the center or the edge, because of building, obstructions, topography. So, uh, but this is just to get, you, to get you the theoretical two possibilities. Most system designs allow base stations to be positions up to one fourth of the cell radius. So from here to here, we have one R. So the radius from the center to this corner most of the designs allow you to have some maneuvering so you can just go right left on the order of one fourth of the cell radius so this is about where to locate the antennas in the base station when it comes to the cellular definitions and some notations we need now to focus because we'll get some variables all right so the first thing you need to know get used is the r the radius of the cell okay R from the center to the corner to the angle, it will equal also to the dimension of the side here, segment. And from top edge to edge, here we have square root of 3R. So that's one thing. When we divide the coverage area of, by using cells, a group of cells is called a cluster. You can see here that we have bold lines to identify a cluster, another cluster. There are three clusters here. Uh, the definition of the cluster is a set of neighboring cells that collectively and distinctively use the available set of frequencies. So all the frequencies will be used completely here, collectively, and we'll have them distinctive, which means every one of them will have different frequency. All these frequencies will be reused in another, set, in another cluster. Once we have defined clusters, we also can define co-channel cells. Co-channel cells are cells in different clusters 
with the same group of frequencies for example we have a here we have a here and we have a here these are co channels co channel cells these are the co channel cells similarly we can identify for example e here e and e are co channel cells n is the is the cluster size so here we have 1 2 3 4 5 6 because we have six edges for the hexagon and then one in the center so this is an example of capital n equal to 7 so again what is capital n it is the cluster size and cells the unit is cells seven cells we will define 1 over n to be the frequency use factor because it gives you an idea of how how efficiently you are using you're using the frequencies so if n equal to 1 it means we are repeating the frequencies we have the highest possible uh, frequency use of course but we'll have interference as n increases we have uh, we can manage with less interference but the reuse factor will be less capital r is the cell radius it's the distance from the hexagon center to the corner and as we mentioned it's also uh, the length of the sides of the segments of, of the hexagon now what is d d in blue is shown here to be the distance between co-channel cells so we have capital R, capital D, and capital N. Cellular system capacity. Now let the total number of available radio channels be capital S. Another variable, capital S, is the total number of radio channels. Remember that now we're not we're not referring to the channel as a medium of propagation. We are de dealing with channels here as chunk of bandwidth is dedicated part of the bandwidth so let there be n cells per cluster as we defined before and each cell is allocated k unique channels so the available radio channels will be divided so capital s equal to k times n if the number of clusters in the surface area let's say Bahran, Dammam, Khubar, whatever the city, Riyadh if the number of clusters in the surface is capital M and then the total number of channels you will need to multiply also by m because this is per cluster now the total capacity or number of possible simultaneous calls is capital m k n or if you want to combine these two it would be ms now c can be used as a measure of system capacity in terms of the total number of channels it give you a measure of the capacity of the system if the cluster size is reduced while keeping the same cell size we uh, then will have more clusters required to cover the area we'll get large c but we'll have because we're increasing m but of course we'll have uh, co-channel interference so that there's a trade-off between capacity and interference in the following box i am summarizing the equation that we have just introduced as we go on the number of variables would increase so it's your job to keep track of them Hexagonal cluster cells. We can have whatever number for capital N, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 6, whatever the number you like. But but if you want to have the following condition, to have uniform co-channel interference distance. If you want to keep the distance from here to here to the next co-channel interference the same, then you have to respect a certain rule. You cannot just have any N. In that case, you need to respect the following rule. N must obey the following relation n equal to i square plus i j plus i square where i and j are integers and we can keep i to be greater than or equal to j so the co-channels are identified by uh, the co-channel cells can be identified by i j as i'm going to show you in the next slide but in the following table you can see that we're filling with integers respecting the fact that i is greater than or equal to uh, j so you have one zero we are not taking the obvious zero zero because there will have no cells so we have one zero one one two zero two one two two you can continue and then get here one by substituting i and j here got one three four seven twelve there is no way you have you can substitute integers here respecting the relation and you get an answer of five or two so this is why the cluster size would be one three four seven twelve provided you want to keep the distance between the co-channel interferers cells interfering cells uniform so no wonder from now on that we see you use 7 12 19 and so on 
So let's move to the next slide and see how co-channel cells are identified from IJ. Okay, uh, we have two examples here. The first, the one on the left shown with colors is uh, capital N equal to seven, where we substituted uh, I and J equal to two and one. On the right hand side, we have capital N equal to 19. We got this by having I and J equal to three and two. So the point here, we would like to know how do we find the co-channel interference if they are not numbered, if they are not tagged here. They, here it's easy because we're saying A, 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 you can define them D, D, D. But what, what if there are no term, what if they are not uh, labeled? The rule says move I cells along any chain of, of hexagon and then turn 60 degrees counterclockwise from the direction that you are moving in and then move J cells and that will take you to the co-channel interfering cell. For example, here we have two and one. So we have six options to go. If you go in this direction, you have to count two. One, two, that's two. And then you move, if we continue, we'll go in this direction, but we'll move 60 degrees counterclockwise, and then we'll move one step. So that will take us here. One, two, and then 60 degrees. One, two, and then 60 degrees, one step. For the second case, we have three and two. So if you take any of the six first tier, we call this tier, by the way, first tier, first circle around the interference, T-I-A-R. So we have, you move, three steps, one, two, three, and then you move 60 degrees, that's 60 degrees uh, counterclockwise, and then you move two steps, one, two, and that will take you to the interferers. One, two, three to the middle, six degrees to the left, and then we have one, two, and that will take us to the interferer. So I, I leave the rest, the rest for you to continue. One, two, three, and then six degrees, relative to the red, if you continue, you would have gone uh, in this direction. Sorry. But we're moving 60 degrees here. So we, we got to, to A. It's time for the example. So it says in this example, uh, I'm calling it example one, determine the number of channels per cell for the following cellular system for n equal to four, n equal seven, and n equal to 12. I'll show you the answer for the first two and it's your job to write the answer in the comment section for n equal to 12. A total of 33 megahertz bandwidth is allocated to the system. It is divided into 50 kilohertz voice control channels, one control channel per cell. The frequency use of control channels is three times less than voice channels. Okay, for control channels, because they are important, if we lose them, we could lose the entire call. To avoid interference, we reuse them at a lower frequency. How much is that order? That's three. So let's do, let's see how do we uh, include this in the calculation. So if, if we do it here, we'll not do it, we'll not repeat them. We'll repeat A here and we'll repeat A here, but for the control channels, we'll avoid uh, the repetition by a factor of three. So let's start by saying we have a total number of channels, which is 33, uh, total bandwidth of 33,000, whether voice or control. And every one of the channels requires 50K. So if we divide 33,000K by 50K, we get 660 channels. There is a K here. Just make sure that you have, you have you got the, 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 the units right. For the case of N equal to four, we need four control channels, right? Uh, we need four control channels. This, by the way, this diagram is not applicable here for the case of N equal to four. This is for the case of N equal to seven, which is coming next. Uh, the channel, uh, the channel um, reserved for control would be four times three. Why are we multiplying by three? Because when we look at the entire thing, we we have to account for the fact that this is less reused, and then the frequency will be used at a lower factor. So four channels times three, that's twelve. However, for the for the voice channels, we have six six sixty, the total number of channels minus the control channels, and that will be divided by four, which is uh, the number of cells per cluster, which give you 162 voice channels and one control channel. For the case of n equal to seven, that's a bit tricky because now we have a control channel. You can stop the video now and try to do it yourself and get back. But uh, if you are running the video, you'll see that we have 21 channels reserved for control, which is seven times three because of the reuse factor. 
And then we have the total number of channels would be 660 minus 21, which is 639, divide by 7 to get the total number of, uh, of uh, voice channels per, per cell. And in that case, you get 91.3. What does that mean? We don't need to approximate here because we have seven cells. Okay, so what we are going to do, we'll give two cells with 92 plus control, of course, and the remaining five cells out of seven will get 91. That will account for the proper uh, number. So with that, we have uh, we, we get the proper channel assignment. So 639 divided by seven. To avoid the fraction, I got two cells to have 92 channels plus control, and five channels, five cells to have 91 plus control. It will remain for you to find the case of n equal to 12. Please write your answers, your answer in the comment section, and let's cross-check our um, answers.